2010's Amnesia The Dark Descent is arguably the most influential horror game to ever release. You couldn't go anywhere online without some dickhead being like, How's it going, bros? My name is Beep. A lot of people argue that its popularity stems from the boom of Let's Play channels, which I won't argue definitely played a factor, but what I think made Amnesia so great wasn't what the game offered gaming as a whole, but what the game took away. If we take a look at the top selling horror games of the 2000s, you'll notice one thing in common. Can you see it? It's that all of these games offer you a means of defense. Almost all threats that come your way bar scripted events can be dealt with in one way or another as the player in most instances is in control. The horror stems from visuals and twists that the game implements within its story. Amnesia however went in a very a different direction. In Bioshock, when there is a threat, you shoot it. In Dead Space, when there is a threat, you shoot it. In Amnesia, when there is a threat, you're screwed. Best of luck, fucker. Where a lot of games opt to make jump scares and visuals the focal point of what makes a game scary, Amnesia's scare tactics stem from you never being in control. If there is a threat, you have to run. If you get blocked in, you have to hide. And if there is a monster right in front of you, kiss your ass goodbye. You can see that a lot of games adopted taking control away from a player post Amnesia's booming popularity. Games like Alien Isolation, Outlast, Slender the Eight Pages, uh, Five Nights at Freddy's, and a very special game called Soma. And where Soma stands out from the rest of these games is that it was made by the same team that made Amnesia, fictional games. While most horror games at this point were following the trend of <laughs> You have no control, <laughs> be scared. Soma was in a dark corner experimenting with new takes on horror. Like, oh, I don't know, making people question what it even means to be alive. The real cost of playing Soma wasn't the purchase of the game, it's the therapy that you need afterwards. Soma and Amnesia are psychological horror games. Games that scare a player, not with visual cues, but ideas, the idea that something lingers in the dark, the idea that you are helpless, and the idea that everything could be for nothing. I want to take a deep look at a psychological horror, and lucky for me, I found some shady dude on the internet selling a hard copy of Soma. So let's stick this game in and begin to break down one of the greatest horror games of all time. What the fuck? This isn't Soma! Well shit. That's embarrassing. The whole opening was meant to hype up an investigative first person story rich psychological horror game. But on the Steam page, all it says for Observer is that it is an investigative first person story rich psychological horror game. Wait, and it's cyberpunk themed? A cyberpunk horror game. The year is 2084. Have they told me? Observer is a testament to how the themes and tones of cyberpunk can translate perfectly to not only video games, but specifically horror games. Observer takes advantage of in-game technology to not only present class status and the overbearing fears of regular people, but also the mental decay of the playable character. And no, I don't, I don't mean the technology used to make the game, the, but, but the actual technology on display here. Like this, and whatever the fuck that is, and oh shit dude, they got Melissa McCarthy for this game, wicked. Look, let me give you an example. In Amnesia, there are two mechanics that amplify horror even when there isn't a present threat within the game. Sanity, a measurement of how the playable character is coping with the events of the game, and lamp oil, a finite resource that gives you the ability to see. Run out of either and you are basically fucked. These mechanics are present in most standard horror games. Sanity is a stand-in for health that can be found in most traditional games, and lamp oil is a stand-in for ammunition or food, a resource that when it hits zero makes the game infinitely more difficult. Observer takes both of these mechanics that we just spoke about and not only adapts them to fit the theme of the game, but also 
combines them. In Observer, you will go through stressful situations that affect your character's synchronization with his implants. Mechanical eyes, cybernetic limbs, enhanced myriad nerves because you're sad and you just want to feel something. If the desynchronization goes too far, you will die. To avoid this, you must inject yourself with a chemical called synchrazine, a rare resource that can be found around the map. However, there is another effect that desynchronizing can have on the player. Desynchronizing messes with your implants, like I just said, but obviously, this includes your mechanical eyes. Your eyes have many different abilities through the game, offering you the ability to scan technology and organic matter and it'll result in evidence being extracted from the scanned sample. Also, you know, you use your eyes to fucking see. For Amnesia, the game made things difficult by taking away the light, making it harder to see, whereas Observer takes away your ability to see entirely, forcing your hand into using up the synchrozines even when you have only taken minor mental damage. Instead of just dragging and dropping mechanics from another game and hoping it'll work like another cyberpunk game that I won't name. Observer takes pre-existing trends and adapts them to fit the world and my fucking god is this world dark. Jesus Christ. Observer makes amnesia look like a game about shagging sunshine and rainbows. Hashtag pride month. Now I don't know if you noticed, but the real joke here was me thinking I'd be able to get a video out in June when I have the work speed of a sloth drenched in gasoline and set on fire. Now that I've set up the more abstract mechanics of the game, I'd like to explain why I love this game so much. But instead of breaking down the individual aspects of this game into categories and reviewing them like I'm reintroducing the world to segregation, I thought it'd be nice to go through this game beginning to end and experience the mystery and twists of Observer the way they were intended. Well, the way I intend, because fuck you, this is my video and I can pace it any damn way I please. Observer opens with a text crawl, setting up the world and introducing us to our main character while also drip feeding us details of the world. Not enough for us to comprehend it, but just enough to make us feel like we are delving into a place of decay. YouTube has decided to copyright claim this entire segment, so it looks like I'm going to be dubbing this. <coughs> the year is 2084. If they had told me what the world would become, I would not have believed them. First, there was the Nemophage, the disease of transition. A digital plague that swept across the land, killing thousands upon thousands of augmented souls. A heavy cost for meddling with our minds and bodies. Then came the war. The big one. The Great Decimation. The West killed the East. The East killed the West. There were no winners. Except for Chiron. One thing I would like to point out is when Daniel says Chiron, the screen does this little white flicker. Chiron is later explained to be a corporate entity, and if you know anything about the world of cyberpunk, you'll know that corporations are almost always built from evil. Most players won't even notice something this subtle, but for the players that do, this plants the seed that there might be something to be wary about. Is this a small hint at the role they will play in the story, or something just to keep the player guessing? I mean, I know the answer, but I think it's fun to post questions for me to give Give you guys answers later. It'll make this video fun. Mostly for me though. I just love fucking with you guys. The text crawl continues and gives us small details that only leave the player with more questions. There's talk about a plague that infects implants, a great war where no one won aside from the corporations, but by the end of the text crawl we get an explanation to what role we play in all of this. I am what they fear, a corporate tool of oppression. A despised leech that creeps into your dreams and feeds off your fears. If you don't remember, if you won't remember, that's when they call me. To access you, to gather evidence, to dredge up whatever's hiding in the darkest corners of your mind. My name is Daniel Lazarski. I'm an observer. Chills, man. Just... <laughs> fucking chills. You play as Daniel Lazarski, an observer hired by corporations to obtain evidence and testimonies from people with or without their consent. I'll say that again. With or without their consent. And from here, it's time for the game to begin, so slap on a diaper and belt strap it in because this game is shit your pants levels of fucking wild. You're resting in your car talking to your superior about the jobs you've completed during the day when everything goes dark and we get a strange call barely managing to break through the static. Careful what you say. This is a monitor channel. Who is this? How'd you get this frequency? 
Don't you recognize me? Adam? Yes. To your surprise, it's your son, Adam. And the way the game manages to establish the relationship that they have without them really interacting is really interesting. After the call cuts out, Daniel tracks the call and the call originated from an Adam Grabinski, not an Adam Lazarski. Grabinski? That's no. The fact that Adam's last name has changed seems to surprise Daniel, leading players to come to the conclusion that they don't seem to see each other very often. There's more obvious stuff, like Adam saying he's been distant the last few years, but the shock of Adam's last name being different really drives home that Daniel and Adam have almost no relationship whatsoever. So, why is he calling you? I really thought I could pull it off, you know? I was so close to making a difference, to setting us all free. And now it's, can't be for nothing. Doesn't matter. Tell me where you are, I'll come and get you. Shit, Dad, for once in your life, just listen to me. Whatever happens, I need you to remember, you're not in control. Adam, can you hear me? You still there? Adam. God damn it. The call cuts out and the lights flicker back on. With such little information on why your son called you, Daniel is left with no real options. You're able to track down where the call originated from, a C-class district called the Stacks. Classes are very similar to class status in our world with letters to distinguish them. And from Daniel's reaction, we know that the Stacks is not a place you want to be. Jesus, Adam, the Stacks. You just had to hit bottom, huh? Rock fucking bottom. Once we arrive at the apartment building and manage to get Simon's apartment number, things start to get a little... Mm, creepy. Walls are covered with digital constructs, almost like a distraction from the reality that the people of the building find themselves in. It's actually really depressing, like painting over a cracked wall. Like, you didn't fix it, you just made the cracked wall pretty. But as you make your way to Simon's apartment, you notice that the door is unlocked, unlike every other door that you've encountered thus far. As we creep inside, we notice cracked walls and damaged furniture. But if you're quiet enough, you'll hear voices trembling from within the apartment. ID 656210. Can anyone hear me? Great. Fucking great. Okay, Dan. Maybe it's not him. Doesn't have to be. Hey, so was this story written by a roundabout? Because this took a fucking turn! For real, though, this is such a. God! What a fucking cool way to start the game! Th th this is where the game starts. This is where everything you've learned so far comes into effect. It's fucking brilliant. After analyzing the body in Adam's apartment, you're given evidence that proves that the person died before Adam called you. Meaning that this most likely isn't Adam, but just someone in Adam's apartment. Attempts at trying to obtain a blood sample doesn't work, however, because for some reason, as you found the body, the apartment complex went into a lockdown. Meaning you have no connection to the outside world. Well, from this point on, you are isolated within this apartment complex, and with the murder still being so recent, that means the killer is stuck inside there with you. Okay, so let's catch a killer. What evidence do we have so far? Well... <laughs> As we were entering the apartment, we could hear someone talking over some kind of speaker, so we will need to identify who this is and interrogate them. 
you're able to get the initials of a caller's ID, HN. You'll also remember that the man at the desk when you arrived was able to look up names in a database within the building, so that'll be a good place to start for looking up HN. We also know that this person was working with Adam, as emails show a collaborative effort between them and one other person whose name was not disclosed within the emails. We also have an email from HN titled, They Know, indicating a potential fear from another group who we aren't able to identify at this given point. Now, let's look at the body. The body has suffered lacerations that would either indicate that the killer was either in a hurry or a frenzy. We also noticed that the victim tried to defend themselves with a stun baton that has an outpit of, and I fucking kid you not, get this, six million volts. The fact that 6 million volts couldn't stop the attacker would indicate that they are what scientists refer to as <clears throat> Dummy Thick. Lastly, we have the lockdown. It might have just been a coincidence, but just as you found the body, the entire building went into a lockdown. Lockdowns are only ever called in cases of a nanophage outbreak. Nanophage being the virus that we spoke about in the opening text crawl. Now that we have all of our evidence, we can begin our investigation. Before we begin though, there's one thing I want to touch on, and it's Observer's ability to make the player feel isolated and alone. You still get to interact with people, but due to the lockdown, it's always on the other side of a reinforced door. Asking questions and talking to people who live in the apartment complex is always bleak and hardly ever helps you with your investigation. People are scared of the nanophage getting to them, and they want this hellish nightmare to come to an end. This sense of isolation not only builds tension and a sense that you're on your own, but aids in one of the scariest jump scares in the entire game. You spend almost the entire duration of the game alone, and over time, you get used to it. You understand that you aren't going to bump into anyone while walking through the complex. <laughs> Until this happens. Okay, it may not seem all that terrifying, but you'd be fucking wrong. The entire game conditions you to believe that you are alone. Every person you bump into is either dead or behind a fucking piece of wood. So you just don't expect anyone to show up, and in doing so, the sudden presence of a headless figure is fucking mortifying. Also, the small detail of Adam's voice playing before showing us the corpse is fucking incredible. It really drives home that even though Daniel has evidence to suggest that the body isn't his son's, he still has his doubts. As you go through the game, Daniel's implants do start fucking with him. It's why we get glitchy scares like this. It's Daniel's mind fucking with him due to desynchronizing with his implants due to trauma, which now sets a new precedence. And it's that we can't always trust what Daniel sees at all times, which is fascinating because it leaves players to theorize what is real and what is more metaphorical of Daniel's mental state. Your fear of the situations allows you to identify with Daniel, but the natural decay of Daniel's mind also leaves players with a chance to look at the story as a whole to see what puzzle pieces fit and what ones are just completely made up by a man who is scared to lose his son for a second time. But back to these door conversations. There are a lot of these doors that are specific to the story, but majority of them are just there to fill out the world and fill the building with a variety of people that live in a Class C district. One of my favorites, though, is a space captain who's been kidnapped and tied up to a chair. You're not able to help him because of the lockdown, so you're just yelling instructions at him from the other side of a door. <laughs> it's great. But after a few back and forths, you're able to deduce that this isn't a space captain. Look, let me just show you. It's, it's fucking fantastic. God damn it! What have they done to me? Sir, listen to me. I want you to park your elbows on the chair, lower your head, and pull backwards. Uh, 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 thanks. I got it off. It's, uh, it's some kind of helmet. There's cables everywhere. There's a logo. Some kind of face with wings? The Morpheus VR series. Huh? The what? Hey, hey! Answer me! As captain of the Endeavor, a representative of the United Earth Initiative, I demand to know what's going on here! 
I hate to break it to you, sir, but there's no such thing as the United Earth Initiative. What? Do you know what a transfer is? No. Why should I? Someone who checks out, ditches reality, lives in a fantasy world. A virtual reality addict. Well, why are you telling me this? You are in your apartment. You're not a captain. It was an illusion, sorry. The lockdown must have screwed up the transmission. You're experiencing atrophy, so you may have been sitting in the same chair for months. Shut up! You're lying! I don't know what game you're playing, mate, but I do know my crew is already looking for me. Right, whatever you say. I wasn't trained for this. I wasn't trained for this. God, what a fucking asshole. <laughs> As I was enjoying these interactions, I was able to find the front desk. Looking up HN, you're able to find two people with those initials, and they happen to be on the same floor. So we are in- ah, Fuck. The first room you check is a Mrs. Nader, and we know this because she insists on being called Mrs., leading us to assume that there is someone else living with her. Miss Nader? I'm with the KPD. Mind if I ask you a few questions? Mrs. Excuse me? Mrs. Nader. All right. Uh, Mrs. Nader. What do you want? When asking about a potential call that came from her apartment, she gets very defensive. Keep in mind, we're looking for a call that came through when you found the body. Have you made any calls in the last hour? No, I have not. Could you check your compass for connections? Somebody may have used it as a proxy. I don't have a compass. Already, we have a suspicion that something isn't right because she's denying to give us evidence. When she is asked to check her implants for any data that could aid in finding out if she is the caller, she refuses because she doesn't have implants. No compass. I thought pretty much everyone had one at this point. Oh, you thought wrong. I don't have any implants of any kind. And from here, things get really emotional really fucking quick. Mrs. Nader demanded to be called Mrs. because she has a wife. A wife that was taken away from her because they got infected with the nanophage. The digital virus we spoke of earlier that corrupts implants and kills people from the inside out. Didn't you hear me? I said it was just me. Then why did you insist on being called Miss? I'm a widow. My wife died many years ago, in the plague. The reason that Mrs. Nader has no implants was because she also got infected, and in a desperate attempt to live and find her wife, she ripped out her implants, nearly killing herself in the process. Sorry to hear that. Is that why you don't have any implants? Yes. Want to see the scar tissue on my face and neck? It's quite an embroidery. The little monsters really outdid themselves. Or do I have to show you what's left of my arm? Would that satisfy your curiosity? Mrs. Nader, I'm just doing my job. Oh, yes, I've heard that one before. When the cleaners took my Laura away, one of them turned to me and said precisely that. I never saw her again. Not even the body. It's like she never existed. Now, a really small detail that I fucking love here is the bubbled skin you can see on Mrs. Nader's face through the camera. As you play the game, you can find these booklets that show an illustrated child who has been infected with nanophage. The more books you find, the more decayed and more horrid the covers get. This gives a good representation on what the nanophage is capable of and its danger to society. It amazes me that we haven't even seen the nanophage in the game at this point and yet the game has perfectly communicated its threat in the world. You'll notice that the same skin condition illustrated on the cover is also present under Mrs. Nader's eye. And this is how we are able to deduce that she's telling the truth. The attention to detail here is spectacular and I felt like I should point it out. So in conclusion, this isn't the HN we are looking for, which means there's only one more room for us to check. So we might as well... Still fresh. Anyone here? Jesus. Hey, 
second victim, badly injured but still breathing. The killer has struck again. While the victim is still alive, they are unable to talk and are bleeding out fast. Daniel explains that with the lockdown still in place, that he cannot save this man's life, but he can stop the killer with his help. And you might ask, how? Well, this is where Observer comes into its own. I could tell you what's going to happen, it might even get you a little excited. But trust me, I have a better way to express what kind of horror you are about to witness. Are you ready? Ahem. <coughs> I'm putting a trigger warning here for depictions of <laughs> high pitched sounds, flashing lights, jump scares, gore, <laughs> and to If you feel that this isn't for you, skip to this time code here. And please understand that this trigger warning will remain for the rest of this video. Everybody ready? Cool. Let us begin. Subject approved. Commencing neural interrogation. We are now inside the mind of the victim. With them slowly dying, we have to act fast, as when the victim's heart stops, we will be pulled out of his mind and will be refused re-entry. There is a lot to unpack here, but to put it simply, when an observer enters the mind of another being, they begin to relive that victim's recent perceptions of their life. And I say perception because a lot of people remember things differently to how they actually happen. That's just simple human bias, and this will play into the story a little bit later, I'll call back to this, don't worry. But for now, let's interrogate. We still need to find HN. Before we jacked in, we deduced that this man is an Amir Novak. A-N. With the last name Novak starting with an N, this could potentially make this victim a potential relative or lover. As we make our way through Amir's brain, we get to witness his life unfolding in fragments. Shattered windows, numbered markings along the walls, running water, monstrous figures, and many, many depictions of prison life. These are just fragments of this man's life. And it's hard to come to a solid conclusion when looking at all of this stuff on its own. But once you put the pieces all together, you start to form a clearer picture. The scratched walls are numbers of days Amir has spent in prison. As every Every time we see numbers, we get a following scene of a mere moving from cell to cell. The running water we see always switches off when we get close to it. We also see a mere waiting for a drug fix in prison, leading players to the logical conclusion that the running water switching off represents an inability to get clean, a term used for addicts giving up their addictions. There is this fascinating puzzle where walking through doors leads you back to where you started, which is such an interesting way to represent a mere drug addiction, because no matter how hard he tries, he will always find himself back where he started. To solve this puzzle, you have to look at the screens in the room that will guide you to where you need to go. Going through doors in a particular order will lead you out of this little maze, which could be referencing Amir getting outside help with his drug addiction, but I might be pushing it with that one. While all of this is exciting and really good character development, the reason we are here is to find evidence that will lead us to HN. Luckily, we are able to conclude that HN N is Amir's wife, as we see them getting married at a tattoo parlor. You'll remember that there was actually a tattoo parlor outside of the apartment building within the lockdown area. Well, that's fantastic. We now know where to find our next lead. But there's something that I left out, however. Daniel gets to examine everything within Amir's mind. This is how he is able to interrogate suspects. Daniel is seeing everything that is inside Amir's head. But guess who else is inside Amir's head? Daniel. Remember how I showed you a scene where Amir got married in a tattoo parlor? Well, I was kind of hiding something from you. Now I could see right through you. I saw that underneath all your muscles and tattoos, you were like a big wounded animal. Lost. Alone. Hey, at least you know what you were getting into. Yeah, I, I guess, guess I, I did. did.
in sickness and in health, forsaking all others? To have and to hold from this day forward until death do us part. Any regrets? None. Did you see it? You probably missed it because you're a fucking idiot, but the man speaking in this scene here, it starts out as Amir, but this line here, that's Daniel. It would seem that when you are observing a suspect, any memories that are similar to your own will trigger you to start interrogating your own memories and not the memories of the observed. The interrogation ends with the victim flatlining, but just before they died, we got to see a scene of Daniel getting married and then we hear his wife waking up in the middle of the night in a great deal of pain. aborted. Subject expired during questioning. Emergency extraction procedure successful. So, the interrogation is over. What evidence did we obtain? Well... <laughs> Unfortunately, we didn't obtain much. We still don't know who the killer is, as we only got a small glimpse of the attack. We still don't know where HN is, however, we do know that they frequent the tattoo parlor outside of the complex. That'll be a good place to start. We also know that HN got a good look at the killer as she was in the room when her husband was attacked. This rules out HN as the killer and is no longer a suspect, but a witness. Our objective now is to find HN, and with HN knowing the owner of the tattoo parlor, there is a chance that she went there for help. Next stop, the tattoo parlor. Just before we start making our way to the tattoo parlor though, I checked my health and investigative notes, and as I did, I got a strange message that reads, help me, room 108. I mean, the apartment room is on the way to the tattoo parlor, so we might as well check it out. What could possibly go wrong? <laughs> That's right, this game has side quests and we will not be talking about them in this video. Instead, I actually wanted to offer some of you a gift. If your name is on the screen right now, that means as of this video being uploaded, you are a part of my $5 tier on Patreon. And congratulations for patrons that are pledged to my $5 tier. You have exclusive access to a whole different video diving into some of my favorite side quests of this game. And for those that aren't pledged to my Patreon, what the fuck? What is wrong with you? Also, did I also mention I sell me- Oh fuck, this segment's been going for too long, for fuck's sake. After crawling your way through an indulgent self-promotion, we finally make our way to the tattoo parlor. The tattoo parlor looks clean and stylish at first glance, but on a closer inspection, you'll realize that there's a dead body in the back room. Well, fuck. Uh, we found HN. I guess we'll have to interrogate her and wait a fucking minute. We can't interrogate a dead person, you might be saying to yourself. And you're right. Our software protocol is programmed to eject us at the point of a flatline. So Daniel being the chad he is, destroys the safety mechanism and just dives right fucking into Helena's mind. The next time you're lying in bed and you want a drink of water, but you realize that the bottle of water next to your bed is empty and you're too lazy to refill it so you just go to sleep deep 
dehydrated. Just remember, this man is diving into the mind of a dead woman in the hopes of finding a son who doesn't even love him anymore. If he can find the motivation to do that, then you can fill that bottle up, you lazy cunt. The first thing I noticed as Daniel jacks into Helena was how different the transition from reality was. With Amir, we got a really painful scream at the point of entry, whilst with Helena, all we get is a subtle gargling and breathing as she isn't conscious for this procedure. Commencing neural interrogation. <laughs> We open to a monitor with a Chiron booting screen. This appears to be a memory of Helena at a job interview for a position at Chiron. The interview starts simple enough with vague questions about wanting your country to thrive and if you want the world to be a better place. But as the interview goes on, the questions start to get sinister. Do you want to live without fear? Do you want to establish a productive relationship with Chiron? Will you cooperate? What makes this question more concerning is the lack of a yes or no option like previous questions. The only option is to press O. Will you comply? Press B. Will you conform? Press E. Press Y. The questions have ceased. All that remains are demands. The Republic is your mother. Chiron is your father. A mother's love is unconditional. A father's pride demands sacrifice. The questions return for a brief moment. Are you willing to sacrifice for the greater good? You will be happy. You will be productive. You will work towards the greater good. Will you obey? I don't know if you guys have noticed, but I think the game might be telling us that big corporation bad. <laughs> hey, what's that picture of Jeff Bezos doing here? After the screen is finished evaluating, I mean, Jesus, evaluating life choices, what the fuck? You realize that Helena worked for Chiron, you know, big scoopy corporation. It was the same one in the opening credits that bugged out. Yeah, turns out it was playing a little bit of foreshadowing. Who fucking saw that coming? It was me. I I, I did, because I'm, I, I'm smart. I'm big brain, small brain, you monkey. I we watched the chaotic environment of the corporate life unfold around Helena. A continuous chattering of keyboards and busy people running around like nutcases. So much noise, so much chatter, but then out of nowhere. <laughs> This fucking slop again. It's called soup. Now dig in. It's not getting any better. When we observed Amir, we saw him in an in we saw him in an interrogate in an in Fuck, dude. Oh, dude, what what is this sentence? When we observed Amir, we saw him in an interrogation room. Fuck, dude, I got it. Fuck yes. Wait, fuck, now I gotta read it again. When we observed Amir, we saw him in an interrogation room being told to eat soup. We see Helena serving Amir soup outside of a prison environment. This blew my mind at first because I realized that we are seeing similar events that were observed by other people. Helena is serving cheap dinner to her husband and giving him attitude. But when Amir experiences this memory in his observation, he feels like he is trapped, imprisoned. Before we can process any of this, however, we get rapid flashes, people running, eyes watching, the static screeching, and then suddenly... <laughs> Then we are alone. Or are we? <laughs> then, music.
We hear a voice offering a once in a lifetime opportunity. Who is talking? What opportunity? Then we start downloading something. The file is titled Confidential. As you are downloading the files, you see a monster walking through the booths. The way this segment works is if this monster finds you, you're dead. But who are we downloading all these files for? None of this makes sense until it does. I don't think I can do this anymore. I think they're on to me. You're being paranoid. No one's on to you. Wait. Is that Adam? Things are getting a little clearer, but let's continue. You make it back to your apartment after a long- Amir! The observation is over, and yet the mind games have only just begun. With Helena's interrogation now complete, Daniel has enough information to start constructing a narrative. And you all know what that means. After a long and dangerous interrogation, we finally have a potential suspect for the murder, but not only that, we also have a potential motive. Helena worked for Chiron and appeared to be stealing data for our son, Adam. We now know that in Helena's email about being watched, we know that she was referring to Chiron. The fact that the killer was at Adam's apartment and Helena's would suggest that the killer knew their connection one way or another. We did see many glimpses of a monster-like figure that resembled the same creature that we saw in Amir's memories. I don't think that they are literal monsters, but just mental perceptions derived from fear and anxiety. The anxiety of being caught by Chiron. We only got a glimpse of the killer from Amir, but here we get a closer look. A monstrous figure, a potential manifestation of Helena's mind reinterpreting what she saw. Now, let's focus on the tattoo parlor. In a desperate escape, Helena tried running to the parlor and was reciting a code. Remember this code will potentially needed for later. We now know that the killer has a motive to kill all those involved in the stealing of Chiron's data. This includes Adam, Helena, and the potential owner of the parlor. But how do I know that the parlor owner could be involved? Earlier in the game, I walked door to door asking questions and I found a man that told me that he was blind and that the man at the parlor was ready to install him a new pair of eyes. With this bit of information, we now know that the owner has the knowledge to install cyberware. In Helena's interrogation, we see a man installing special cyberware. That being said, she could have gone anywhere for cyberware, which is why I'm saying that there is a potential. Our new objective is clear. Find the owner of the parlor and bring him into custody for questioning. 
Upon inspection of the parlor that I don't have fucking footage of, I was able to find a numbered panel. Naturally, I put in the code that was recited in the memories, and boom, a door opens and leads to a downstairs area. And would you look at that, it's the same room that we saw in Helena's memories. God, I'm just fucking too good, man. The beast-like creature that killed the others is now after us. With no other way out, you escape into the tunnels and eventually find yourself on the basement level. And boy oh boy, does this segment fucking suck! suck! Now it doesn't suck because it's boring or difficult or anything like that. I'm just the biggest idiot on the planet. Walk through the basement and find a door. This door is the only way out of the basement level. You don't have the code to the only door leading out of here, so I have to find the code. This recorded segment that you're watching now goes for over half an hour. I couldn't find this code anywhere. On the walls, in other people's rooms, on the ceiling, nothing. And at this point, I was starting to lose my mind. Until I found a door where a lady just fucking tells you the code. Maybe, maybe you know the code? We all know it deep within our hearts. Yeah, uh-huh. Could you spell it out for me? Um, 40 and... four. I felt like an idiot this whole time, but I have the code now, so I guess we can- Oh. There is a number missing. Okay, well, I'll put 40 and 4 in and then just guess the final number. No, that that's all the numbers. I I just tried all of the numbers. Maybe I heard the lady wrong. Let's go back. It's me again. Dan. Daniel. What a pleasure. As always. Yeah. Well, that door you mentioned, turns out it's locked. Any other way out? No other way, Daniel. Maybe, maybe you know the code? Forty and... Four. Four zero four. And the, the final number? That's for you to find out. But don't tarry, Daniel. This place is not meant for you. If you stay for too long, you'll drown with the rest of us. Wow! Thanks for nothing, you stupid cunt! Oh, maybe it's a trick. She said 40 and 4. Maybe the number is supposed to go in front of them all. I, I don't understand. I, I don't understand. What does this game want from me? Wait, what? Yeah, so it turns out there is a hack button. You can't really see it because I played the game on ultra wide, but if you press it, it'll just give you three of the four digits, but four zero zero. Ah! You can see the fucking rage I felt the second that the door opened. And while I was being a complete nutcase, the game decided that it wanted to be a fucking game again and not a torturous machine that wants to hurt me! You walk up the stairs and open the door. This is not the apartment building. As you walk forward, your vision starts to bug out and you hear whispers. Hey you, come over here. With nothing to interact with, you continue forwards, only to find yourself at the beginning of the hall. You bolt to the end of the hallway to leave again, but you are trapped. KPD, state your business. Your well-being. Jack shit. Yes. And no. What do you think? What's this about? Why, you, of course. It's always about you, isn't it? 
Don't fuck with me. That's not why I'm here. It's time to move on. The voice talks about moving on, and you are given four options of dialogue. Don't make me get the enchanted membrane. I smell like daffodils on a corpse. Ugly fairies don't make dreams come true. And the floor is one dragon above you. Whatever you pick, it does not matter. I'm feeling obnoxious. Relax. It's just a matter of time. Time waits for no man. Time is nothing. What's the problem? Jumbled letters, a clear indication that no matter what you pick, you are not in control. I'm losing control. Try not to think about me. You were good. Good at talking out of my ass. Don't leave me. You are my man. This intercom is offline. Please contact the building manager. There's a few things I'd like to draw your attention to here. Don't leave me and you were my man. Over the last two observations, we have been slowly obtaining samples of Daniel's memories. Memories of his past. A confused son, a hopeful wife, and a doubtful husband. This voice is Daniel's dead wife. Daniel isn't her man anymore. She's gone. Much like the intercom at the end of all of this, she is offline. Walking through the door leads us back to the apartment complex, and we are reminded that we need to find whoever owns the tattoo parlor. Walking outside, we find the hand of the building, and he is able to give us a name, Jack Carnes, Apartment 210. Problem is, when you get there, the apartment is already open. At first glance, the apartment looks normal as any other, but walking around the corner reveals a life of luxury. How the hell could Jack get a room this fancy in a shithole like this? Graceful music fills the air until... for 16 minutes and 43 seconds real time. Daniel is starting to lose his mind. Observations aren't supposed to be conducted on the dead. He is so far gone that he has no memory of even finding the body and initiating this interrogation. And the game doesn't just make us start the observation only for Daniel to say he doesn't remember us doing it. I showed you everything. That's how this initiation starts. Even the player has no recollection of finding the body. We just walked into the apartment and the interrogation is underway. What makes this even cooler is that when you go to scan the body, there is nothing for you to scan, as everything has already been logged as evidence. Daniel was already here. He's done all of this. We just don't remember and have no recollection of such events. Daniel is starting to fall apart. The interrogation yields hardly any evidence as we only get vague glimpses of Jack's life. However, we are able to deduce that the mystery man that we saw in the emails was Jack earlier in the game. Despite the little evidence we got, everything is coming together and we are left with only two questions at this point. Who is the killer and who was the dead man in Adam's apartment? Jack was able to injure the killer, leaving a trail of blood leading us to their secret hideout. So it's time to hunt 
the hunter. If only it were that easy. Daniel's synchronization is rapidly decaying. The synchrozines appear to help his vision, but that doesn't stop his mind from plummeting into insanity. We follow the trail of blood, the bellowing growls of an injured killer rattle our soul and start to eat away at our mind. But we push on, despite our mind starting to play tricks on us. We see our mind now playing back memories while we are still conscious. The cupboard that we lifted in order to get into Adam's apartment symbolically falls once once again, the lockdown that traps us in this hell begins to echo in our minds and covers the walls in rich, vibrant red lighting. It's mocking us as we desperately long for freedom. The doors that once kept us safe from the killer demand to be opened. Blood and gore dress the walls, almost as to laugh at our failure to save a single life thus far. Maybe we can change that, if we can find Adam in time. We see the city as a living thing, an organic life that consumes everything, including our perceptions of reality. We find locked doors only for our mind to give us the answer while taunting us with memories of our neglected wife. Her voice calls to us. It is a calming bliss shrouded in darkness until only darkness remains. We are isolated, alone, no one here to help us until we find a certain door. Hey PD. I need to ask you some questions. Shh, keep your voice down. He'll hear you. Who will? The one of many shapes. We don't speak his name. Does he live around here? Below. He lurks below. Only comes out to hunt. How do I find him? You don't. He finds you. He always gets his prey. What are you talking about? No, I've already said too much! I won't let him hurt you, if you work with me. I can't! I'm sorry! He'll know! How? He's coming! He's coming! We managed to escape into a forest with no way out. There's nothing. It just keeps going. It is only when we scan the area with the scanning technology that I referred to before that we are able to see a reality underneath this illusion. Following the path of this scanned world leads us out of this entangled plane and back to a more familiar reality. The visions for now have ceased, but this won't be the last of these mind games. We get back on the killer's trail. We hear the clanking of steel and bone and the growls of our vicious killer. We have him right where we want him. We have finally found the killer, and the only question going through my head is WHAT THE FUCK IS THAT?! Is this Chiron's killing machine sent to destroy those who oppose them? There is only one way for us to find out. It's time for another interrogation. But this observation is different. This isn't a story about a killer gone mad. This is a story of a little boy. A boy born different to everyone else. A boy who is bullied for the way he looks. A boy deprived of his father's approval. And a boy whose only friend is his mother. A boy told that he'll never be normal. A young, small boy who finds comfort in media. We all have our days where we feel broken, and sometimes a song, a movie, a game, or a show can make us feel a little bit more understood. And for our young Victor here, it was the story of the werewolf. 
A man turned monster who hones his ability and strikes fear into those who would belittle him. We see a memory of him learning to ride a bike with his father. Those that surround his reality laugh at him. He dreams of becoming that which people fear and that he no longer is afraid. And as Victor grows up, we see his memory become a reality. Victor is a boy who was made a monster by the only people who were supposed to protect him. And here he is, dead and finally at peace. In memories, we see him hunting down his prey. The victims, stalked and slaughtered without remorse, we hear a voice deep within Victor, telling him that he is embracing who he was always meant to be. Wait a fucking minute! Was the killer just some crazy dude? Nothing linked to Chiron? Just some boy turned wolf turned killer turned dead guy? Okay, look, I understand this seems like a spit in the face to everything that this game has been building up to, and honestly, it is! Or it, or, or it was, or it, it had. <sighs> look, just understand that it does not stay that way forever. Let's just keep going. As we investigate the area, we are able to find Victor's den. In the corner of the room is a table, and on that table, we see the outline of a head draped in a cloth. This is it. This was who was murdered in Adam's apartment. It's time to put all of this to rest. It's Adam, and yet, Adam still speaks to us. Dad? Dad, are you there? What kind of a sick game is this? Dad, I'm still alive. The head. Don't connect to it. Connecting to this head could drive us deep into madness, but we did not come all this way to not get answers. Before Adam's voice cuts out, he tells us to head to a place called Sanctuary, but Sanctuary can wait. The transition into Adam's mind is terrifying, as we can slowly see Adam as a child slowly fade into the final screams Adam gave out as he died. This same scream that Adam is giving off here is the same scream we were able to hear in Helena's interrogation. That to me is just so fucking cool. If you happened to slightly identify that scream and kind of recollect that it sounded like Adam, you would have already figured out that he's dead. As we've been playing through the game, we've kind of realized that Adam was a man that kept secrets and he was dedicated to keeping those secrets. So dedicated, in fact, that we can't even break into his mind. Instead, Adam's dead brain just fucks with you and makes you play arcade games that will always result in you dying. This immense buildup only to fucking dunk on you and say, get fucked, idiot, was just Ah, oh, dude, you expect a traumatic revelation that will conclude the game, but all you get is fucking TETRIS! Despite you finding out that Adam is dead, he still calls out to you. Is this Daniel's mind going into denial? Or are there more sinister elements here that we just aren't seeing? We make our way to Sanctuary. Sanctuary turns out to be a company that offers simulated worlds that you can escape to. You find that there is already a booking under your name. You accept the booking, enter this digital reality, you find the answers that you're looking for. You find Adam within the simulation and he asks you for your help. Adam explains that while he worked for Chiron, he was developing a program that would take your consciousness and upload it into a digital realm with you leaving the body entirely. No replications. When Adam was fired from Chiron, he hired Helena, who was working for Chiron, to smuggle out his research so he could continue his work. Jack, the parlor owner, was hired to install the software capable of letting Helena download all of Adam's work. However, despite their best 
efforts, Chiron would be right on their tail. Chiron would end up finding Victor and would send encrypted signals that Victor would hear as a voice in his head that would tell him to kill all of those that were involved in the data heist. The first victim, sadly, was Adam. But just before Victor was able to kill Adam, he removed his consciousness and uploaded it to the digital realm. You still find Adam dead, but this is just his body. His consciousness has been living in sanctuary. That's how he's been able to fucking contact us. The lockdown wasn't triggered because of the nanophage. It was a virus uploaded to the building's network programmed to hunt Adam's digital mind and destroy it. The lockdown itself also stopped Adam's digital consciousness from leaving the area. He's trapped inside of this district, leading Adam with no choice but to send out a signal calling for help before the lockdown came into effect. Everything now makes sense. The killer may have been Victor, but it was Chiron manipulating him into seeing the victims as prey. Amir, Helena, Jack were all killed for their involvement with stealing the data from Chiron. And with the virus slowly killing Adam, he now needs your help to get out of the stack's mainframe and into a safe location. All of the leads and evidence we have is interconnected. I mean, okay, I mean, there is one thing this game kind of fucked up though. We know that Adam defended himself with a stun gun, but he couldn't have been fighting Victor if he was already uploaded. It's a small detail that the game missed, but overall, what a cool fucking twist of events. Adam ends the simulation asking you to end the lockdown by entering the high rise above the apartment network and destroying Chiron's firewall. The firewall is the only thing keeping Adam him trapped and the lockdown in place. And if he doesn't get out soon, Chiron's virus will surely kill him. You leave the simulation and head into the high rise, only to find a hidden Chiron imprisonment complex stored with people infected with nanophage. It really is the fucking fade. Okay? You've been exposed anyway. Keep it together. I previously praised the fact that the nanophage had not been seen during the game, but we were able to get a grasp on its effects on the world. It kind of sucks that the reveal of the nanophage is just this like three second flip of a body, and I genuinely couldn't tell if he had nanophage. All of the visual representation we've been having of nanophage throughout the game just doesn't feel that present here. I really wished that they had just left the nanophage out of this game entirely. This was kind of just a waste. After dodging Chiron's monstrous guard you are able to bring down the lockdown but before you have time to act Throughout Observer, we have seen many people's stories. The story of Amir, a man that struggles with addiction and the inability to get a job due to his past actions. We see Helena, a loving wife so dedicated to making ends meet that she would augment her entire body beyond repair only to get caught in the end and for it all to not matter. Then there's Jack, a successful man dissatisfied with his victories, longing to be a part of something bigger than he could ever hope to grasp. But what's the story of Daniel and Adam? Through this game, I've been giving you small glimpses of their life. A wife turned ill, a confused and scared son, and a father unable to explain the situation to a rightfully frustrated son. It's time that you all know their story and how all of this Everything that we have been through on this journey comes to an end. There must have been a misunderstanding. I was told you decided not to undergo the augmentation procedure. Yes. Just to be clear, you do realize that that drastically decreases your chances of recovery? I... I made my decision. Thank you. Honey, I'm proud of you. You can do this. I know you can. I'll be there for you. You owe me this much. Promise. 
promise me you'll take care of him. Whatever it takes. After you left, Mom was very sad. I asked her what was wrong, and she said the doctors could cure her, but she wasn't sure she wanted them to. It's not that simple. The, what the doctors wanted to do, there was a, a heavy price to be paid. She wouldn't be herself. She wouldn't be your mom anymore. That's not what I'm asking. I want to know. Did Mom decide for herself? Did she really want this? Of course she did. Your mother believed she was strong enough to beat this thing on her own. I did too. But she wasn't. I just wanted her to be all right. Why didn't you save her? Jesus, there's barely anything left of him. Can he hear us? Yes, but he's very weak. Please, make this brief. Dad, it's... it's pretty bad. They need to replace a few parts. If you're a little confused, don't worry. At first, so was I. We aren't sure what killed Daniel's wife. What we do know, however, was Daniel discouraged his wife from being augmented, which would have saved her life because it would have changed her beyond comprehension. Only for him to be put in a life or death situation years later and augment his body in order to survive. The monsters we've been seeing through the game are corporate tools. Men and women that augment themselves to work environments where they strike fear into those who are deemed threats. And in the process of changing himself, Daniel became one. After letting his wife die on principle, that augmentation is never the answer. The monstrous beings that all of these people fear are those that can get 
into their minds and find out the truth. All of these monsters were other observers. Daniel works for these corporations. One of those monsters could have been Daniel. But none of that matters now. The firewall is down and Adam's free. And you'd think this is how the story ends. Adam in the digital realm. You're not quite sure how you got here, but it doesn't matter now. He explains that the virus, despite the firewall being gone, is still after him, and that he will need to merge his mind with yours in the hopes to outrun the virus. You've come this far. You'll do anything for your son. You jack into his mind and start letting him in. Only to find out that everything was a lie. Chiron had nothing to do with these killings. The voice that told Victor to kill everyone involved in Adam's project was Adam. Before his death, Adam was turning his consciousness into a digital one. He was replicating that over and over and over again, bringing to life and killing digital versions of himself for research until one of those digital Adams refused to die. This digital Adam would end up finding Victor and would tell him to kill the living Adam. Remember how I said that the baton was a plot hole and that Adam wasn't in his body? That wasn't a plot hole. It was a hint that the digital Adam was lying to you. Just before our son died, he let out a virus to make sure that his digital creation wouldn't escape. Your son killed your son. And with the digital Adam wanting to cover up his existence, got everyone else killed as well. Chiron had nothing to do with this. This is an AI gone rampant. However, he's technically still your son. You're given a choice. Do you let what's left of your son merge with you in order to save him? Or do you refuse and let the AI that killed Adam die? I'm tired. Let's get this over with. Very well. If you think you're ready to make your choice, will your son die? Or will you save me? If you refuse to merge, this iteration of Adam confesses that you never actually left Sanctuary. Me complaining about the seeing the nanophage? didn't happen. We weren't lowering a firewall. He didn't care about lowering a firewall. He was slowly breaking down your mind in order to take over your body. And if you refuse, he does just that. That's disappointing. I was hoping we could do this the easy way. But since you failed to see reason, I'm afraid I'm gonna have to insist. And what? Break into my brain? 
you think I've been doing for the past hour? I've been chipping away at you ever since you got into that capsule. You're breaking my heart, asshole. No, Dad. Just your mind. That's it. But luckily, you're given one last chance to stop the AI before he escapes with his new identity. You're able to take over the body of the building tender and you try to kill Adam before he escapes, only to get shot by the police. We fade to black thinking that we succeeded, with the last words we hear being. God, what a mess. Is he breathing? Wait, check it. But there is another way. If you let Adam take over and merge with you, you both manage to get out alive. Sort of. I won't let you die. I make my promise. I intend to keep my word. Thank you, Father. Down has now been lifted. Thank you for your cooperation. Hey you, look down. I know, Janice. It's been taken care of. Calls uh, your people. Should be here in a minute. Thank you. I'll take over from here. You can get back to your post. Yeah, just a slight glitch. Don't take care of it. The sun will come up soon. We'll get to see it together again. No worries. We'll get used to this. We have all the time in the world. I love Observer. Its presentation, its mystery, its twists, its world building, its ability to fill you with a sense of terror and yet at the same time still look so beautiful. Observer is a testament to what the settings and genre of cyberpunk can offer media. Now, I didn't make it obvious in this video because I didn't want it to be the focal point, but yes. This video is 100% a jab at CD Projekt Red Cyberpunk 2077. That's right, I'm still not over this fucking game. The next video is gonna be 10 hours long talking about how there was only two settings for penises in Cyberpunk 2077. I will never forgive you. Also, if you do wanna see the video of me diving into the side quest, feel free to pop on Patreon, slap me $5 and you can get some access to some pretty cool behind the scenes stuff and you get to have your name at the end of the videos, participate in polls, uh, I'll suck it. Do you hear that? It's that piano again. It's strange actually because I don't remember that piano actually being a part of Observer. Now that I think about it, that piano only seemed to play when we found people dead. <laughs>